What's up, nerds and nerdettes, and we little nerdlings all. Your buddy Big Johnny G from Two Gun Pixies Legendary Gaming Presents is back once again. Why am I intruding on your precious computer time while you're surfing for more important things than games? Because there is nothing more important than games. And I got a game I want to teach you how to play. Today, right now, right here. And that game was designed by Peter Hawes, produced by Eagle Griffin Games, and it's called Triassic Terror. The only, I could be wrong on this, but the only area control game I know of where you get to not only eat the other opponents, but take them out of existence, make them completely extinct. The only one I know of, if you know of another one, put it in the comments below, because I want to know what that game is. So why don't we zoom in and take a moment, and I will show you how this game is played. All right, this is the way the board looks up, looks like, all set up, ready to go. Now, how did I set this up? Why is it set up like this? We're going to discuss that right now. First, each player is going to pick a dinosaur. And they're all color-coded, as you can see. There's up to six. Here's four of them right here. You're going to pick your color. I like green. And you're going to put that off to the side next to a Tyrannosaurus Rex of the same color. We'll get to the T-Rex in a moment. Once you have your color picked, you're going to set the board up. Now, the board is set up. You see, I have some dino figures out here already. The Velociraptors, they show you on the board exactly where they're going to start in the game because you can see the picture. Same thing with the game's T-Rex as well as the Pterodactyl. Uh, they don't have a plastic mini for that, which may or may not be cool depending on how you decide to take it. I think the picture's all right. I kind of wish that they had an actual plastic figure for it, maybe on a clear stick holding it up to make it look like it was flying. But anyway, you're going to put them right where they start. Now, the board is broken up into four environments. You have the swamp environment where everyone's going to start. You have the forest, the desert, and the mountain. And if you notice, there's a volcano right in the middle of that. And that actually plays a potential part in the game up to the players if it does or doesn't. And we'll get to that. But each environment, you will notice, has three rings with three circles in each ring. These are the areas. Each environment has three areas and each area has three habitats. Now, in a five- or six-player game, the smaller or tertiary will have points as well. But if you're playing anything but a five- or six-player game, only the primary and secondary will have scoring points on these stones, scoring stones as the game calls them. So now to set up the game, now this, this took me a minute to quite understand, but they do have a handy-dandy little card to help you with it, as long as a similar picture in the rule book. Now, the game is set up. I set this up for a four-player game. The meeple, the meeples here, the little picture people with the number, that's how many players in the game there is. While the number in the circle is the number of the specific player. So in a four-player game, this is where the first player will start here on the three. And you follow the pattern all the way around. And in this case, it shows that a player starts in the three, the four, and in the bottom area, the two and the four. That's the way you set this up. And the card, this did come in very handy, I thought, to tell you the truth. It really did. So the game is set up. These two tiles, because we have tiles. Let me just show you this. Zoom in on the last two. I'll move these out of the way. At the start of the game, the tile for raptors and the tile for herd migration will always start in the five and the six slot. You will take one of these white dino meeples. As you can see, they're white. They're not aligned to any player color. And they're going to start right like that. Now, the other ones you're going to mix up, and you're going to place on the other spots for the action tiles. Now, the action tiles, you notice, had numbers underneath. Get to that in one moment. You're going to choose a player to be the first player. Really, only the thing that the first player uh, token gives you is the ability to choose what action tile that you're going to take first. The game doesn't say how to choose, pick among yourselves, flip a coin, roll a die, who was at a museum last, who saw a dinosaur movie most recently, however you decide to pick. Let's say, let's say that the green player was the first one. So green gets to choose one of these first. And this is where the, a lot of the strategy comes in. A combination of the environment cards and the action tiles. Player 
on the first turn of each of the three geological epochs, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, you're going to be drawing an environment card. You can see it has the little drawing that matches, so you know that means an environment card, as well as an action tile. On every turn, you will draw an action tile. But for a four, a three, four, or a, a, a five-player game, you're only going to choose uh, the, uh, the environment cards on the first turn. There are slightly different rules for the number of players, so make sure you check your rule book exactly for the number of players and how you're picking the cards. But in this case, a four-player game, you're going to get to choose either the top card that was shown face down, because after you shuffle it, you will take the top card and face it down. A player can choose this if they want, or they can take one off the top. If they choose the one that's face down, they simply replace it so the next player then has an option. So let's say you decided to take the one that was face down. You're the green player, so you decide you wanted the mountains for whatever reason. You like that to start off with. Next thing, you have to choose one of these. Now, the reason I mentioned this before, the white dino meeples, every turn one of these cards isn't taken, you're going to add another white dino meeple to it. At any time during the uh, time that you're choosing your action tiles, a player takes this, they will remove these three, or however many have accumulated, even if it's just one, and they will replace them with an equal number of dinos in their color. The round circles represent three, while the meeples represent one. So that's why you have these here. So let's say the first player decides to take Hatch. I'll get into the meaning of these in a moment. I just want to show you how the tiles work. And another player decides that they wanted that Raptor card. Another player wanted the T-Rex. And the last player takes a new environment. Like I said, I'll get into what these cards do and why you want to take them. But I wanted to show you this first. On the second turn, after the first turn's over and everyone's gone, you're going to go back over here to the chart. Anything that's not taken gets slid down as far as it can go. And then you're going to shuffle the cards that you've already used, and they will get randomly placed in these other slots. I wanted to show you that right first off, because I think that's kind of important. I didn't want to forget it later. So let's put this back where it's supposed to be right now. Now, on your turn, what, you're, what, what you want to do, the purpose of this game is you want your species. So if I took herd, also, uh, you're gonna, this is really the only thing these guys are for is for holding your spot. Because after you choose tiles and cards, this determines who's going to do their actions first, in order. Only thing these plastic ones are for, besides playing with. That's all it's for the game. So now the object of the game is you want your herd, your color-coded dinosaur, to be the most dominant, most prolific species at the end of the game. Actually, you also kind of want it at the end of each of the uh, the epics, the geological epics that are going on here. So you always want to keep that in mind. Growth, growth, growth. That's what you're looking for. Now, how do you do that in the game? You do that by playing the specific cards. You can play the cards and the environments in any order that you want. So if I had, as I've shown you, chosen these two cards, the herd growth and the mountains, I can play them in either order that I want. Doesn't matter, as long as they both get played, because you don't get to hold on to your cards or tiles until the next turn. One turn, they're done, they're either discarded if they're an environment, or if they're an action tile, next turn they will go back on the track somewhere. So going over these cards, first I want to go with the environment, because that's very easy, that's very universal rule. Any environment that you draw and you decide to play will allow you to take three, or you can use the individuals, you know, if you want, no big deal. You can use the three, and you can place them in any of the habitats that are not taken. Any habitat that is open, or add to a herd of your own in that habitat. Right? So the mountains, which is over here, I could take this and put this guy over here in the center ring. There is no other player here. So my herd, the green herd, is the largest. The largest herd will always take the primary habitat area. If another player comes in and they have the same amount, nothing changes. They will go to the second. 
However, at any time in the game that one of the players changes the number, now they have four, three and one, four versus my three, they will dislodge and dislocate or relocate to the larger habitat, chasing the other herd or pod of dinosaurs to the next available highest habitat. So with the mountains or any of the environment cards, that's going to play the same. As long as uh, there is an open spot, you will go to the highest habitat in that environment. Now the action tiles are different. The action tiles each have their own purpose. The one that I chose here, and I will go over all of them, uh, the herd growth. Herd growth allows you to add twice to existing herds. You will be able to add three to any one existing herd, and you will be able to add two to any other existing herd when you play this action tile. Let's take a look at some of the other action tiles. This, I think, might have been one of my favorite ones. It's hard to say. The T-Rex. So at the beginning of the game, I showed you that the T-Rex, like the Velociraptors and the Pterodactyls, has their own starting spot. If the player plays this, they remove the game's T-Rex, and they will then put their associated color T-Rex there. Only one T-Rex is on the board at any time. This will stay in the possession of that player until a later turn when another player takes this tile and decides to play it, at which point it will be changed out for the new color. This will count as three dinosaurs for you. And so as long as it is in your color, it will count as three dinosaurs. Now, what it does is it can move up to... Uh, I believe this one, yes, the T-Rex can move up to two areas. So it can move one and then two. It can move one and then two. As long as it is moving to an adjacent and not cornering itself. So it can't move from this center ring in one move up to the top one here. That would take two moves. One, two. One, two. I think you got the idea with that. Now, when he's moving, he gets hungry. This big boy, as you can imagine feeds a lot. So if you move him into an area, he doesn't go into a habitat right away, he's just in the area. And when the dinosaur gets to the area, depending on whether he moved one or two, will determine how many dinosaurs he can eat, how many dino meeples will get consumed. If you only move to one spot, then you can have up a total of five. I know those aren't matching colors, but you get the idea. Up to five dinos he will eat. If he had only moved one spot, he would eat three dinos. He counts as three dinosaurs himself for your count. So the green player is considered to have three dinosaurs. He will move into the habitat that is highest for him. So if there was one dinosaur here, when he came in and ate the other ones, then he, being three points, will move into the four. This guy will stay here. Now remember, as I said, whenever you have more dinosaurs, they will take the larger habitat area. So if this guy then later gets four, he will dislodge the T-Rex into the three habitat spot. Let's see the other cards here. When you play new environment, you get to add three dinosaurs to any habitat in any area. All three have to be put into the same habitat but it can be put in any area regardless of whether you have a herd of dinosaurs there yet or not. So you would be able to take this and put it into an area, and again, if there's no competing dinosaurs there, you will take the highest habitat. If there was more than three here, this player would go into the three spot. So a new environment helps you to open up new parts of the board that you have not traveled to yet. Hatch there's two ways to hatch. The action tile is one of them. When you play hatch, you again get three dinosaurs, but they have to be added to an existing herd. Obviously, they're hatching. Something had to give birth to them. So you play this in any existing herd that you have on the table. So if I had had one guy here, then that would get added to him. Her, it, them. Use the pronoun of your own choice. 
But you'll notice there's something else about this. It has a picture of the pterodactyl. That's because not only does it hatch, but it will give you the option, much like the T-Rex, you can move two areas with this. He can fly one area, he can fly two areas. And when he's flying around, he'll get to eat two dinosaurs. Take the three, leave the one. So you have the T-Rex, you have the Velociraptor to eat your opponents. Is that it? No, it's not. So if a player took this, if the green player took this, this would get tossed aside off to the board, and the green player would have another dino to add to an existing herd somewhere. When you play the Raptor, you get to move both of these guys. You get to move Laurel and Hardy wherever you want. However, one of them can only move one area. The other one can move up to two. One, two. When they move, they actually do two things. They don't just eat like the T-Rex does, but they will. They will definitely eat um, two dinosaurs of your choice from a habitat in that area. As you see here, that leaves two, so the three would move up, and the two would move down to the lower habitat. But it's not over yet. Not only do they eat, but they also scare the living out of the other dinosaurs. And what that causes is a scatter effect. So up to two other dinosaurs will scatter into other habitats. They will stay in the same environment as long as there is a habitat for them to scatter to. If they have no choice, then and only then will they move to another environment. And that could be dangerous. I'll get to that in a moment with the next card. So he comes in, he eats two, and he is going to scare off two dinosaurs that are going to take off. Uh, and they're going to go into different habitats from each other. And that's what both of the Velociraptors do. You can move one two areas and the other one area. Now, as I said, it can be dangerous to leave an environment. Herd migration allows you to not only change your area, but you can change your environment as well. So if this player decided to migrate, let's say the purple player said, it's time to migrate this Velociraptor, Pterodactyl, too much eating of my pod. So I'm going to take my herd and I'm going to migrate them to another environment. Now, when you do that, two things are going to happen. Because of the shock of a new environment, you're going to lose one of your dinosaurs who will die. But the other thing that happens is each dinosaur in an adjacent habitat will follow you. So these two were adjacent to this spot here. So this loses one. This loses the only one it has. These two get replaced with the appropriate color of that player because they become your herd. Now, there's no one here, so they will move into the high spot with the six. While if another one came in, if another one came in with seven, let's say, and got into the area, then these guys would be dislodged to the smaller habitat. You are always, this is why I've been repeating it, you're always going to move the larger herd to the largest habitat, dislodging the other herd. And that's what the migration does. There are two players' chits, chit, C-H-I-T, that each player has. Each one of these can be used only once during one of the geological epochs. So once during the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous, you can play one or both of these. This is Hatch. It does the same exact thing as this, only minus the Pterodactyl. If you play this, you will then get to add three more dinos to any one of your existing herds. You also have the Volcano. I mentioned that earlier, because there's the Volcano in the center of the board always ready to explode and erupt. When this is played by a player, that player will place this in any one of the environments, in an area in that environment. So let's say this was placed here in the swamp. What's going to happen when this happens is that 
all of the dinosaurs that are in the the primary, the primary habitats, they are going to lose two dinos. That might even make them extinct. Like if this was the case, this guy is going extinct right now. You're also going to lose one from the secondary and the tertiary. So as you can see, the way this was set up, this volcano just wiped out what was on this whole part of the board. And this will stay here until the beginning of the turn of the player who played it, the next turn. So as you can see, the more players you have in the game, the longer this is going to be out, and the longer it's going to affect everyone. And again, depending on how you choose, how you choose, if you were the first player and you played this, and then the next turn you're the last player, that's almost a full two turns that this is going to be out. Not only does this kill, but none of the dino herds are going to be able to move into or out of this area. The area, however, the predators are free to flee. Not come in. If this was the volcano, they could flee to any other area. And that's it until the scoring. So this will advance. And by the time you get to the score round, you're going to do exactly that. Now, the game comes with several of these boards. One of them is in German. Das wunderbar. The others are in English. And you can see it's a cool little sort of cheat sheet to show you what all the action tiles do. But besides that, it also helps with the scoring. Because the number of players in the game are going to determine how you score. Now, every time you score, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to add up you're going to add up the points on the stones that the dinosaurs are currently holding. So the red player would add up all the stones that their red dino meeples are on. In this case, for a quick show of how it plays, there would probably be a lot more, but who knows? You would have four and you would have six points. So the red player would move down to the, up to the six mark. Now, you also see that there is, uh, for the four player and all that, you see there's a P, a P, and a D. What these mean is they are a difference for special victory points that you're going to get during the game, meaning presence and meaning dominance. Now, these two factors will make a big difference in the scoring of the game. The difference between them is that the P for presence is you're going to get a total of eight extra victory points for the player who has at least one dino in each of the environments. So if you have at least one dinosaur in each of the four environments here, then you will get then you get an extra eight points. The D, the D that is on this that you will score in a four-player game only at the end of the Cretaceous period, which for a four-player game only goes to round one and two. Dominance is another way for extra points. In dominance, it is the player that has the most dinosaurs in a given area. And that player will get an extra bonus points. For the most player, it would be another eight. And this is going to happen at the end of each of your turns. And by the end of the game, you uh, get points for the total amount of dinosaurs that you're going to have on the board as well. And you're going to track everything like you do in a lot of these games with the cool tracker along the side. And that will determine the amount of points by the end of the game. So environments, areas, habitats, you get to play action cards. You get to play at the beginning of each of the turns. You're going to get to play an environment card and add three dinos anywhere in that environment. And by the end of the game, you're just going to hope that you are the most dominant player. And there's a lot of tactics in the game, especially when and how you play. The Predators are a very big deal in scoring points and causing the other person not to have enough presence or dominance in the board to score their own points. So the real, the real tactic in the game is a combination of using the Predators as well as using the, uh, the action tiles. But that's it. That's the game. It really runs very simple. The rules all flow very nice. And the charts and cheats that it comes with are more than handy. 
Um, that's it. We've played a couple of games of this already, and I'll be doing a full review coming up soon. But that's the way the game plays, and let's have a little bit of a send-off. All right. So uh, the game flows pretty good. There go the rules and, the, and how to play the game. It, uh, it's a fast game once you learn it. But this isn't the review part. Just want to give uh, give you a little send off. See, uh, also want to ask: Is anybody out there uh, have this game? If anyone has the game, if anyone's owned the game, leave a connection. A uh, connection. Leave a comment down in the bottom for us, and let us know what you personally thought about the game. And we're going to be having our full review up now that we've played the game a couple of times. We might play it another time or two. Uh, another variation of how many players we're in, and then I'm going to be ready to give you guys a full uh, on uh, two gun review of it. But for right now, this was the how-to play. Peter Hawes' Triassic Terror by Eagle Griffin Games. It's available now. It's been out for a few years. Uh, 14 and up. Uh, two to six players. Anywhere from 90 to 120 minutes. And that's the game. So this is your buddy, Big Johnny G from Two Gun Pixies Legendary Gaming Presents. And I am signing off because I am out of here.